Thank you all so much for joining me. Before I begin, I need to pray. Father God, we just come boldly before your throne of grace. We thank you so much for being a part of our lives. Thank you so much for leading us and guiding us. Thank you for giving us a double portion of your love, mercy, and grace. Father God, allow us to receive your word today. Let it stay hidden in our hearts. We plead the blood of Jesus over your word in our hearts, God. We ask that you allow us to manifest the things that you want us to do by being obedient to your word, God. Let us fulfill your plan, will, and purpose for our lives, Lord. Allow us to be sensitive to your voice, God. Let our ears always be tuned to hear you and follow you, God. And most importantly, God, allow us to be able to minister grace to those that we, we encounter, that which is edifying to the hearer. And um, let's see, God, we, we would also like for you to just take our burdens and concerns. We lay every burden and concern and lay it at your throne of grace. God, we ask that you remove every burden and obstacle out of our path in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much, God, for being you in our life. Thank you so much for filling me up with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you so much for just being a part of my life and leading me. I just pray that you allow me to discuss everything that I need to discuss today so that, you know, we can live a, a bountiful life, a, a life that is fulfilling. And most importantly, God, we, we ask that you please allow your will to be done in our life. In the name of Jesus Christ, it is sealed in your atonement blood. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining me today on Laws, Life, and Health. Let's talk about it. So today I'm going to be continuing on in the discussion of women's health, okay? Now, I know yesterday um, when I started talking about the tissue and the chemicals and the tissue and stuff like that, I said that you all can go ahead and read it, but the Lord put it on my heart, so I'm actually going to be going through each one of those, okay, and just like comparing the prices of them and to see you know which one may be um suitable so all of them are um that all of them are non-bleached and they are chemical free so um it may be a good idea to purchase some of those tissues okay so first off now normally when i get tissue i purchase about 20 rolls of the scott tissue that's what i have been using um but since i found this a uh, chemical free tissue i'm definitely going to be purchasing one of those i'm going to try each one that i have posted on the website and i'm going to give you all some uh, some feedback about it okay so what i wanted to do is um go over that but before i get into that and talking about the chemicals i also would like to provide you all with some useful tips on purchasing the right type of shampoo including the right type of soaps um including the right type of sanitary napkins, right? Because I did talk about that, but I I went I didn't go into great detail about which type of products to purchase for uh, feminine hygiene. And so I would like to also go finish going over the toxic links article. I know I'm not going to be able to do that today, but I just wanted to give you all some direction so you can sort of gain momentum into the direction that I'm going with this podcast and this blog of women's health, okay? Um, so before I get started on that, what I would like to do is talk about the different characters. Um, so there's always failures before opportunity. And so what I have been saying for a very long time is that failure is opportunity. And so we have to look at failure as a outlet for us to grow and improve in our lives, right? Don't look at failure as a level of defeat because failure is not defeat. Failure is opportunities for you to improve and grow in your life. And so I want to talk about some characters in the Bible about how they were feeling defeated and they, they um, you know, they perceive themselves as being defeated, but then they, their perception soon changed into success through the power of God. Okay. And so mind your mindset shapes your overall health right so your thinking everything starts with a thought so the thought causes you to react to things it, start, it causes you to behave a certain way so it's all in your thinking the power of the mind right so god wants us to not be conformed to this world but be what be transformed by the renewing of our minds and so let me go ahead 
and pull up this um i'm gonna pull up the discussion today all right and if you have any questions please go ahead and put them right here in the um q a right here and i'll be able to see them right there okay fred if you have a question please put it here and i will i will answer it for you there okay all right so uh, moving forward right I want to look at the first thing I'm going to look at is, is something that I have been talking about with someone for the past couple of days. Now, um, there, the Israelites were basically Moses. God told Moses to go free the Israelites in Egypt, and so he went there and he freed them. Basically, he led them out of you know the land of Egypt. Um, but there were a series of different things that had taken place with Pharaoh and his army, right? So the Israelites were, they finally was let go after Pharaoh was cursed with the firstborn um, of all the males in the land. So they were basically, you know, taken out um, because of a curse that God had placed on Pharaoh because Pharaoh did not want to let the people, of uh, Pharaoh didn't want to, to let the Israelites go. So moving forward from that, right? They actually moved, um, they, they left, they crossed the river. And so now they're exiled out of Egypt. So instead of them, you know, going right to the promised land. So what could have took, taken them 10 days to reach the promised land, it actually took them 40 years, okay? And so they had doubted. So you have to understand that the opposite of faith is doubt and unbelief. And doubt and unbelief is what leads people to being defeated but doubt is a perception doubt is accompanied with perspective your concept and your per perception of how you are viewing a situation so um for instance here if you go to the book of numbers chapter 13 verse 25 so after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned. So Moses wanted them to go out and explore the land, right? Um, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. So Aaron was the, Aaron, I believe, was a priest. And so they reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit that had taken, that they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent to us to explore. And it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak, the Amalekites live in the Gib, and the Hedatites, Jubasites, and Amorites lives in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. So you see, Caleb, he's like, well, Caleb and Joshua, they, they had the spirit of faith. Caleb had a spirit of faith. So let me give you an example. So all of my kids, they have biblical names, all right? The reason why is because biblical names, hey, Sean, thank you for joining me. I haven't saw you in a while. Um, so my, my kids, they all have biblical names because there is power in the name, right? Power, power, power in the name. So, so far, Caleb, he is, he is saying, he's saying to Moses, like, let's go at once to take the land. We can certainly conquer it. He just heard, like, just how bountiful, beautiful it is. It's filled with milk and honey. This is the promised land, okay? Verse 31. Now, let's look at, this is the doubt and unbelief that's taking place here. So, it says in the verse 31, but the other men, who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. See, that's the first form of, of thoughts. We can't. 
See, doubt starts with what you can't do. Doubt starts with being pessimistic rather than optimistic about a situation. See, you know, the cup is half full, half empty. You only you can only see the negative. You don't see the positive. You don't see that it's filled with milk and honey. You know, you, they're not seeing that it, it produces fruits, right? That they're not seeing all of that. They're seeing we can't go up against them. That's a pessimistic attitude. That's, you know, that is an uh, implicit attitude that, that says that I can conquer this. I can do this. I'm decisive to the point where I know that God said that we can go down, that I saw our land. I am sure. I am assured of what God can do. That's not what they were seeing. They are seeing themselves, perceiving themselves. We can't go up against them. They were hesitant. They were unsure, right? They uncertain. But for why? Because of fear. When you say you can't do something, oh, we can't go up against them. We can't go up against them. Now, why? Why are they saying this? They are stronger than we are. See, they seeing themselves as being weak while they're while the giants to them are, are strong. You can't perceive yourself as defeated before you try something. I tell people this all the time. Look, keep that doubt and unbelief to yourself. I don't want to hear it. Keep the doubt and unbelief to yourself. Because guess what? God wants you to see yourself as great. God wants you to see yourself as being a conqueror. God doesn't want to see you saying, oh, we can't go up against them. What could have took these Israelites 10 days, took them 40 years. Let me go, let me pull up that scripture. So this is going to be in Deuteronomy 11. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 1 through 8. So let's go there. One through eight. So let's look at this here for a moment. Let's make sure. I want to make sure. Let me read the full chapter here. Okay, so this is this is how I want to say this. Okay, so we're going to look at verse 1 through 8. So go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. It says, these are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. That is, in the Arabah, opposite Suth, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Desahab, it takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh, Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. It takes 11 days. Okay. Look, look, look. It's saying it's verse two. It's saying it takes 11 days, right? So 
it takes 11 days to, for them to get to the promised land. That's what this is saying. And verse three, in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month. So what this means is, um, let me finish reading to verse eight. So in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. This was after he had defeated Sihon, king of Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon and at Edre, and defeated our king of Bashan, who reigned in Astoreth. East of the Jordan, in the territory of Moab, Moses began to expound this law, saying, The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Arabah, in the mountains in the western foot hills, in the Negev and along the coast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon. And to Lebanon as far as the great river and along the coast to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river of the Euphrates. See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to you, your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Okay, so basically what this is saying here is God gave them the promised land. In verse two, the passage sets the settings of Deuteronomy. The Israelites are now in Kadesh, Barnea, the edge of the promised land. So they are at the edge of the promised land. So what is interesting is that verse two says that it is only days of, that is only 11 days of the journey from Mount Horeb, where they initially set out to go. However, if you look at verse three, that is 40 years have passed since then and have just arrived there. So they are 39 years and 354 days late in getting to the promised land. And finally here, Moses brings a news from the Lord saying that it is now time to enter the promised land. So you see, they... It should have had only taken them 10 days to get to the promised land because they were already on a one-day journey. So instead, they are in a 40th year, here, 40th year, in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month. It took 40 years for them to figure this out. So let me let me put this in here. I want to put this. Uh, I'm going to put it at the bottom. Okay. Give me one moment, please. I apologize about this. Just give me one moment. Okay, I want to go go here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna post this right under here. Okay, I'm gonna put it right here. And then I'll put Deuteronomy one through eight here. Okay. So what could have what could have taken them ten days took them forty years, okay? And so that just really, really doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? But it took them, it did take them forty years to get there. Let me put this here.
Okay, so this is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 1, verse 1 through 8. See, when the Holy Spirit lead you to talk about something, because I didn't even know I was going to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to say, um, So what what could have what could have taken ten days took forty years. Okay, why did it take them forty years? Well, it's obvious why. It took them forty years to make it to the promised land because of doubt and unbelief. All right, so we see that it, it says in verse two it takes eleven days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount. See your road. And then continuing on now, this 40 years later, in the 40th year, 40 years later, 40 years. Oh my God, my God, that takes so long. God, please do not ever let me to have to take that long to change anything in my life. Okay. Um, so we always want to be able to grow and understand what God has for you okay so that is part of what was going on with the israelites they had doubt they had unbelief that led them to defeat so instead of them taking 10 days to make it to the promised land they are in their 40th year okay so that that's what happened so let's go back to numbers we're going back to numbers um uh, to Numbers in verse 31. So we see, but the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. So the people that explored the land with Caleb, see Caleb, Caleb seen the giants. Caleb seen all of that, right? And so these men that had doubt and unbelief, they wasn't talking like Caleb was. Caleb seen all of it, but Caleb was like, look, let's go at once to take the land. He said, we can certainly conquer it, right? So they can conquer the land. But the other men that had explored the land disagreed with Caleb. So like I was saying, all of my kids, they have biblical names. My, my oldest son, his middle name is Caleb. So Caleb has a spirit of faith. And, and I got this um, from the Bible because Caleb is always going to have a perspective, uh, perspective where he's an overcomer. It doesn't matter what he sees. He's an overcomer. So my child, Caleb, is always an overcomer. He's always going to have a positive perspective no matter what he's going through. He's an overcomer. He don't feel defeated because he, he's not defeated he's undefeated right so it's power in the name power power in the name my daughter faith faith god gives us faith each and every one of us a measure of faith so faith 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 god has gifted us to have faith so that's a reminder my child my daughter is a constant reminder of what god has gifted me to have faith and not just the spiritual faith but also now i have faith in the physical form in my life as a constant reminder of god giving her to me god giving my kids to me as a blessing so our children are blessings which is why god manifested himself into the flesh and he became the son the son of man right so the, the body of Christ is the bride, right? So you, you understand? So God, God shares an order with us. And it's always going to be the God's order. So 
Um, going back to here. Uh, so some of the men they disagree with Caleb. Caleb, you know, Caleb was an overcomer. He he looking like we could overthrow these giants. This is our land. Let's go at once to take the land. That's what he wanted to do. But the other men who had explored the land, they disagree with. It. So we can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bare report about the land among Israelites. So it's one thing for people to speak doubt and unbelief. But it's another thing for them to speak doubt and unbelief to everybody else. So just because you feel defeated, why do you have to go around and make everybody else feel defeated because you defeated, right? So you got to be careful who you're listening to. Be careful who you invite to give you advice into your life. You want to be inviting the Holy Spirit in your life. You want to let God lead you in your life, right? Be careful who you're listening to because that same person who you're listening to, they may be saying, we can't go up against them. Because they have a defeated attitude. They have a doubt and unbelief in a mindset, in their thinking. So they say, oh, they are stronger than we are. Pessimistic. The cup is halfway empty. Instead of saying the cup is halfway full. So you have to understand that they, in verse 32, they, so they spread a bad report that people are going to go out and spread bad news. See, don't go, you don't want to try to go register in that college because they're not going to accept you in there anyway. Ain't no sense of going to apply for that job. Why would they hire you? You don't even have the right clothes on. How you gonna get to work? You don't have any money to get to work. So you understand? So they go out and they spread this bad report about the land to the other Israelites. Because they defeated. So they want to make you feel like the way they feel. Instead of them saying, you know, Caleb, Caleb say, come on, let's go over there and take over the land. Let's go at once to take the land. He like, look, we we gone. Let's take flight. Boom, we gone. Let's take flight and go over here and get this land. This was this our land. They not they not saying that. They saying, oh no, we can't go against them. They are too strong. Let's go tell everybody that how weak they are. How do that sound? Like, how do you come like that? You need to go in and you don't you don't want to just make yourself feel weak because you don't want to be feeling left alone. So you have to make everybody else around you feel weak. Why? If you defeat it, you need to see God. So they going to go spread the gossip, spread the bad report because it's not a bad report. The, the good report, the land is flowing with milk and honey. Milk and honey, okay? The land is flowing with milk and honey and every kind of fruit that it produces. Fruits, fruits, milk and honey, they got food there. But then they, they, in verse 32, they say, so they spread this bad report. What was the bad report? The giants, that's all they heard. They have selective hearing. Have you ever been around people that walk around and they have selective hearing? Did you, it, did you hear what they say? It's not what people say most of the time. It's what you thought you heard them say. They, I guess they didn't hear the fact that the land had milk and honey and it produces fruit. All they heard was the giant. They walking around there defeated because they have selective hearing.
only thing they heard was it's giants. They probably didn't hear none of the rest of the story besides giants. They didn't hear nothing else besides that it was giants. Once they heard giants, everything else, they ignored everything else that was said. Now they got to go spread the bad report. I didn't hear a bad report. I heard that the land is flowing with milk and honey. What is you hearing? See, people are going to always try to tell you, no, you can't do this and you can't do that. See, no, why would they help you, girl? Uh-uh. That's not going to work for you. They is not going to finance that car for you. What makes you think that you going that is not going to help improve your credit? You need to do what I did. Don't try any new ideas on your own. Just do what they did. Because they don't want you to explore nothing. They want you to feel weak, feel with doubt and unbelief. So every time you talk to them, they want you to feel depressed because they depressed. They want you to feel stressed out because they stressed out. They have selective hearing. You about to go into your promised land. This is what God said. God said this, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is, this is in Numbers. Now, the Bible is not in chronological order. But what we do know is said that God said, look, it is time for you to go to the promised land. What, what could have took them 10 days it's taking them 40 years, 40. Because they sitting up here listening to all the doubt and unbelief around them. They ain't, we need more Caleb's. Caleb, he, he went the same place with them when they went to explore that land. Caleb went to explore that land and he was with all the other doubted, doubtful men. But he didn't see what they saw because the only thing they could hear was they selective hearing. They chose not to hear anything else. They weren't listening to God when God said it showed, this is the promised land. After God didn't raise the sea up for them to go across the sea. After God done done all the things that he done done for you in your life, you got a nerve to doubt? Who are you? After God done set you free, he saved you from that abusive relationship. He saved you from bad creditors that tried to rip your credit report. He saved you from all of these different things and you got enough nerve to doubt God. Because you got some selective hearing. Where you only hear that it's some giant. When God didn't say that, hey, you are going to make it to the promised land. Quit doubting God. Quit listening to them people that's defeated. They're going to feed you doubt and unbelief. They went to go spread a bad report among the other Israelites. Isn't that some nerves? You should get mad. You should get, that should cause you to have a righteous indignation. Remember when Jesus, Jesus went to the temple and they were selling things out of the temple. And so Jesus, he was, he got mad. He turned stuff over like, ah, you know, you all are turning my father's house into a house of thieves. To a den of thieves. That's what he said. That was a righteous indignation. If somebody is telling you about God, and then all of a sudden, the only thing you could hear is the doubt part. It's the unbelief part. You can't hear nothing else. 
Why are you having selective hearing? Don't be devoured by the enemy. You can't, you, you should have a righteous indignation when people try to stop you from telling you other stuff than what God has already promised you. It don't matter about what they think. It don't matter about what they say. They got to get their thinking in order be before they can change their mindset. See, they thinking, they focus on the things of this world, carnal minded. How you gonna be carnal minded and think you're gonna be blessed and prosperous? Quit worrying. God has already given you the promise. He got out every single covenant, every single promise for us. Not just me, for us. So quit listening to these bad reports from people that have selective hearing. Because when they come back and tell you a story, they ain't gonna tell you about the milk and honey part. They ain't going to tell you that the land is flowing with fruit. They ain't going to tell you how, how much, how prosperous you could be when you invest and, and, and you listen to what God is saying and you tithe and give into the kingdom of God. See, you are in poverty because you don't know the principles of giving. So you don't be, you won't be in poverty if you knew how to give. The Bible says that God says to bring ye forth the tithes and offerings into my storehouse so that there may be food in my house. So when somebody say, well, oh, well, see, why do we got to tithe? Why do we got to give our money to the church? Well, well, why do you think? The church have a light bill, a grass, lawn care service bill. They have a gas bill. They have uh, everything, water bill, trash bill. But you could buy your favorite artist CD and you make them rich. Or you download the Spotify app and you could pay that app to get their service. Or Apple, right? You plan for a YouTube subscription, but you can't tie and get your offering. You wonder why God ain't giving you them promises that he promised. So it starts in your mind, with your mindset, your perception, the way you're seeing yourself. Are you seeing yourself defeated? Because these people clearly, clearly, they cannot go up against the giants because that's all they heard when they explored the land. That's all they saw. That's all they saw was the giants. They didn't see Look, it's milk and honey. It's food that produces fruit. So in verse 32, so they spread the bad report about the land among Israelites. The land we travel through and explore will devour anyone who goes, goes to live there. Do you see this report? Do you hear what they said? They said, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. This is the report that they telling the other Israelites. So no, 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 no. Don't, you, you don't need to go and apply at that school. Just go work at this job and save you some money. You still gonna be able to accomplish your goals. First of all, go and invest in yourself. The thing that differentiates all of us is the, the way we utilize the utilization of time. How are you appropriating your time? How are you utilizing your time? Invest in yourself. Invest in the skill. It doesn't have to be a degree. People with skills are making just as much as the people with degrees. Because guess what? Organizations, they are valuing individuals with degrees and skills as being equivalent. But you have to understand that there's a certain type of attitude with the person who has went to school for many years. 
They have a certain level of discipline. They have a certain attitude of being teachable and coachable, right? So you you need to need to hire attitude and train people for the skills that they need. So what's really important here is like like for instance, let me let me let me say this. So today, I get an email about a job. And so this job was like a job that I had applied to that I really wanted to get or whatever, but I didn't end up getting an interview or anything because the lady said that I needed the IMCIS uh, software experience or something like that. Now I'm sitting here like, oh, Lord Jesus, it's like one thing after the next. Okay. So I'm a certified in Oracle, a Oracle software engineer. I have two certificates, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure and also Oracle Cloud Data Management. I have all of this stuff that is specifically for Oracle. And, and so now you want me to have one other skill, which is ICMIS. Well, then I, I, I looked, I was about to send out an email and say, you know, they did hire the U.S. Board of Education chief or something like that, that had came from transportation. They had experience in transportation was like the, the CEO of trans, the, not, no, the chief, the chief, uh, I think it was the chief operating officer. I don't know. It could have been a COO of transportation, but they hired the same person to do education. The person had no education experience whatsoever, but was over transportation. Hold on one second, please. Thank you all so much for holding. So just think about this for a second. If this person had no experience in education, but was appointed by Donald Trump to run over the United States Board of Education, the, the head person in charge of education, but came from transportation, there is nothing similar or even, even directly correlated with transportation and education, besides transportation, transporting students. So there's an indirect correlation. And guess what that indirect correlation? The indirect correlation is the fact that this person has experience as being a chief operating officer. So you have to really pay attention to the perspective. There are so many organizations that could really be thriving if they begin to hire the right talent. But is there perspective that is really biased or hindsight hint bias that prevents them from hiring real good talent? And so for me, I just feel like it's a breakthrough for me, okay? I feel like God is positioning me exactly where I need to be. So I do want to work a job until, you know, um, sometime after I graduate and then I finish up publishing some things. There are a lot of different things that God has, has planned for me to accomplish. And these things will be accomplished in the name of Jesus Christ. So what I'm trying to say specifically is I would like to work a job until I am being positioned completely to operate my business more efficiently. But one thing that God knows is that I don't want to work in a culture that is a negative work culture. And if you believe that I have, if I have all of these skills that you're looking for, but yet and still you, instead of you interviewing me or hiring me for that position, you want to say, well, this one skill you don't have, I feel like that job is not the job for me because they probably are micromanagers, right? And they don't analyze results. They, they manage people instead of managing results, instead of managing quality, 
They manage people. So I don't want to work for an organization like that in any way. So it really doesn't bother me that some of these places are so um, particular. And they are particular like that because nine times out of 10, they're most likely micromanaging people instead of managing quality of results. And I don't want to work at an organization that actually will not value their uh, internal and external customers. So how are these organizations perceiving their prospective employees, right? So don't be, don't feel bad. Don't be alarmed. Don't feel, uh, you know, down or don't even feel drained. All right, just understand that there is a process that God allows us to go through for a reason. So if you're not getting that job that you've been trying to get or you've been applying here and here and here and here and all these people like, oh, it's just that one skill they want to get. Let it go because that's not where you're supposed to be. God wants you to be somewhere where you can show the quality of work that you can do in addition to maintaining and over exceeding results. So organizations that type of nitpicking are usually when you get hired, they're gonna nitpick about the other things too, okay? So let it, let it go and let God. Let go and let God. Don't allow yourself to feel defeated because you didn't get the job that you wanted. That job is probably something that you would not have wanted in the first place. Because if the organization can nitpick about one skill, they're gonna nitpick in other areas. Let it go. Your peace of mind is something that God wants you to have. God wants you to go to a work and have be a part of a work culture that produces quality, where you can integrate your skills while also advancing yourself and advancing others in the organization through collaboration. And so when you're making those sort of collaborative efforts and things like that, you're going to be able to network with the right people. You're gonna work in a nice work culture. So understand that perspective matters. So when you're, you are a woman, women's health, this, this topic is about women's health. This, this right now, this discussion about the scouting report from the Israelites going to explore their promised land, their land, it's about you maintaining your mental health. Work for an organization that values results over managing people. And, and I know you may say, oh, how can I do that? How can I do that? Pay attention to the way that they interview. Once they ask you, hey, you know, well, do you have any questions for me? Think about the way they respond. I, I, I go into interview mode right then and there. I say, okay, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask some questions here. First things first, I like to know, what do you like most and what do you like least about working for this organization? My next question is, how do the organization collaborate with their top performers and those individuals that are producing low results. You ask them questions. It's your time to shine. Interview the interviewer. It's about perspective. So although I use this, this analogy about careers and jobs, you need to take this attitude and you need to look at it in other areas of your life. Because see, these Israelites, they all seen the same thing. But what's different, what made them distinct was their perspective about what they saw. Don't let 
the perspective fade or cloud your thinking. See, God is going to lead you exactly where you need to be. So this is the report that the, the Israelites that disagree with Caleb. The land we travel through and explore will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. Ding, 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 ding. That's all they saw was giants. See, sometimes when you're interviewing at a company, they're not going to see the quality that you have. See, because people that manage other people, all they can see is tunnel vision. A lot of times they don't even ask the right question. They're not probing into you. They're reading from a piece of paper. They can't even show their face on the screen. But they want you to interview with them with your face shown, but they can't even show you their face. Why would you want to work for an organization like that? The, if, if you're interviewing virtually at an organization, right? And so this say this organization, you're meeting them on Microsoft Teams or you're meeting them on Zoom, they won't even turn their camera on. But you're talking to them and you're just looking at their photo. Why would you not see a problem in that? Do you not see a problem in that? The first thing that I see is this one. They can't even show you who they are. No accountability. They want you to be accountable to show up and show your face, but they lack accountability and can't even show who they are. It's all about eye contact. Are you even paying attention to me right now? You know, am, am I just speaking just to speak or are you really engaged? Can they show that they are being, they are being engaged with you? If they can't show you that, how are they gonna delegate work to you? Those are usually managers that don't even produce results. And if a person is asking you the same question over and over and over again, they already have doubt and unbelief about you anyway. Just answer it and move on. Answer it in a similar way and keep, keep answering it in a similar way. But just know that you, you're not going to want to have to deal with those type of organizations anyway. They are not accountable. They're more pessimistic than optimistic. That's why many of these organizations cannot make it on the Fortune 500 list. And then some of the ones that are on the Fortune 500, they can't make it to number one because they have employees that are disrupting the efficiency of their organization when they could actually be working at their fullest potential, but instead they're hiring talent and managers that really, really, really are bosses instead of transformational leaders. So you, you, don't, you don't let these people contaminate the work culture. This is what the Israelites were doing. They were contaminating the culture of the other Israelites. The land we travel through and explore would devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. That's all they saw. They don't see anything else. They don't hear anything else. They have tunnel vision. They can't broaden the scope. So in verse 33, it says, we even saw giants. Well, duh, isn't that the same? This is the second time they mentioned it. First they said huge, and then they say they saw giants. So if you saw huge people, why do you got to talk about the giants? Now they, they are reaffirming their doubts. They putting a, they adding another wrench in there to reaffirm that you're weaker than those giants. 
They said, first they say all the people were, all the people they saw were huge. Then they say, we even saw giants in the next sense. Isn't that the same thing? They want you to say the same thing over and over again. Like, why? Why are you saying that over and over again? You just spread in the contamination of doubt and unbelief. So we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. They felt like grasshoppers. How you gonna, you gonna let somebody make you feel defeated? You an ex to them, huh? They can just crawl and step all over you. It's okay to be passive, but no when to be. Women should be passive to their husbands. Not aggressive at home with their husband and then passive, uh, not, not aggressive at work. And not, I'm sorry, not aggressive at home with their uh, husbands and passive at work. That's what I meant to say. So you passive with your manager, but your manager is giving you mental health problems. You so tired of work. When, right when you come home, you talking about work. Everybody in your family know about everybody that work on your floor. Never seen the people, never talked to them or nothing. Everybody in your family that you're close to know the people at your job. Because you won't stop talking about it. They have made you so unhappy that now you bring in work at home. So why do you want, why do you think everybody wants, you didn't work eight hours, 10 hours a day, and now you're going to go home and talk about it. You haven't had enough of that job that keep giving you mental health problems. Because it's stress. And stress on your brain, guess what it does? It impacts your prefrontal cortex. It, 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 it sends signals to your amygdala in your brain. It interferes with your hippocampus. It messes with your learning ability. It impacts your decision-making skills. Stress. You can't even make the right decisions no more because you sitting up here stressed out about what you did. Heard at work. Just like these Israelites. They had selective hearing. They had selective vision. They saw what they wanted to see. Quit being defeated. They said they felt like grasshoppers. There you go with the employer, the girl, your friend at work. Girl, you know they talking about terminating you. They talking about to land people off. Don't nobody want to hear that? Nobody. You need to tell your co-worker, girl, keep that doubt and unbelief to yourself. I serve a God that is a mighty God. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If they do a layoff, my name is not on that list, baby. In Jesus' name. So it don't matter about these people, they seeing giants and now they seeing themselves as being grasshoppers. Your name is not on that layoff list. You can scratch your name off of that report for cancer because you have to trust God. He said it and he gonna do it. They say, they say, oh, you can't pay your rent. Okay, you, you come pay it. It's fine. Go somewhere where they're going to help you pay. And then make sure you get a job in place of that to start paying your bills on time. Don't feel defeated because you lost your job. That Just understand that God wanted you somewhere better. They might be paying a little less, but guess what? The right manager, they might see you and you might get promoted and get paid way more than what you was making before. 
So you have to understand, are you seeing yourself the way that God sees you? Or are you a grasshopper to a giant? Because it's no mountain, no giant that God can't get you through. When it rains, when it storms, when it thunders, when it's a tsunami, when it's a hurricane, they can't last forever. You got to end. The problem that you're going through will not last forever. So it says next, to them we felt like grasshoppers and that's what they thought too. So they, they don't even, they not only just saying it, they, they not only just saying it, they're defeated, that they can't go against them because they not strong enough. Then they spread the negative news. See, let me give you an example. When I worked, I worked at, um, I worked at several different banks. Well, a few different banks, right? And I worked in capital markets. And so when I worked in capital markets, I issued credit lines to multi-billion, trillion dollar organizations. Many of these organizations, some organizations were multi-million dollar corporations, but many of them are multi-billion or um, trillion uh, organizations, corporations. So corporations and organizations are called entities. So these entities that I was able to approve different lines of credit, it could be treasury facilities. For instance, let me give you an example. Working um, at BMO Harris Bank. Now, Christ, no, I'm not going to say the name, but I'm just going to say ABC, ABC Business. And ABC Business, they needed to get... Uh, $75 million treasury facility. But instead of one treasury facility, they need about 50. So this is ABC company and that ABC company, they need to house 800 cars and a $75 million treasury facility. But guess what? If I look at they, if I look at, you know, their, um, annual income, and I also find out that some of their C-level execs, C-level executives are, in fact, guess what, doing business, and they have negative news, then certain lines of credit can be decreased with ABC companies. So just say, for instance, they hired a CEO who knows a politician that has negative news and so i will look on the website and check for politically exposed people check for negative news because we value the company's assets it's my job to protect the bank's assets and so as i protect the bank's assets it's imperative that I do a thorough analysis of all of the C-level executives, including their association, including the uh, associations on the annual income uh, report or the annual statement, the annual report. I'm looking at the SEC files. I'm looking at everything. And so all of these things, I'm going to check for negative news. So your association, could impact your lines of credit because of the fact that you are associating yourself with individuals that have negative news. And so guess what? That could be a liability. A liability to the bank's assets. So it's important for me as an analyst, a compliance analyst, working in capital markets, that I am doing a thorough analysis. If you are around people who are thinking like these defeated Israelites, 
and they are have all type of negative news and negative news, negative news. I need to see the positive news. So even though I, I analyze negative news, I also looked into the good news. Because now I need to follow up on what, what this negative news, what was the end result of this negative news. So many analysts, they're not going to look at just the follow-up. They're just going to say, oh, this is negative news. So I would train, even though I wasn't a trainer, I still would train other analysts and say, hey, you know, when you find something that's negative news, you want to show a thread. There needs to be a pattern, a sequence that you're following to make sure, okay, this is the beginning, this is the middle, and this is the end result. Don't just post one thing. That could be inaccurate. So we need to look at this collectively. It is imperative that we protect what? The bank's assets. So yes, you can see negative news, but when you're an optimistic person, your perspective is like, ah, no, no, no. I need to know the end results. So what, what happened when you went over to the land? What else did you see besides the giant? Because you already said it was huge. Then you said it was some giants. So now what else did you see? So you need to be an optimistic person. So when people are coming to you with negative news and bad reports, you got to say, whoa, 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 wait. So what are the options? What are the other options? You know, um, can we exhaust every possibility here? Could, could, could you give me uh, some scenarios? and exhaust these scenarios to me just so I can have a collective sense of what you're talking about. Quit accepting these reports from people. Oh, girl, you know she did this. You know she slept with that man. You know she was around now, around the corner. Like I said, y'all keep listening to y'all cousins. You keep taking up for all these people when they out here doing bad. But when are you going to stand up for God? It's time that we become sick of sin. If God gave us a promise, hold on to the promise. Believe God more than you believe people. You sit here believing all these people. You, I bet you're going to believe your cousin when they around the corner talking about, girl, we, we about to go over here and fight these people down the street. Come on, come on, let's go. Oh, they went over there and they did this and now you listening to your other gossiping cousin. And now you listen to all these other people and this person and that person and this person and that person. You listen to all these different people when in fact, what you should be listening to is God. How is God speaking to you through that person? If you don't hear the voice of God being spoken to you through that person, how can you continue to take advice from them? So at that point, when you don't hear people giving you advice, that's coming from God, it's time for you to minister to them. And if you're not doing that, what is your purpose? Because if you're taking in the knowledge and all the wisdom that you have, but you're not sharing it, what is the purpose? So make sure that you're not seeing yourself as grasshoppers. Quit listening to bad reports. Let's go to the next chapter. So in Numbers chapter 14, it says, then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. This is the response. Let me go to the NIV verse. Numbers 14. 
That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. They wept, crying. That's what weapon is. Like Job. Job was a weeper. So all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt. God has delivered these people. They have walked through an entire sea. God lifted up the waters for them to walk on dry land at the bottom of the, the bottom of the sea. They walked across, got away from Pharaoh, and they still down God. Talking about, oh, if, if we had only died in Egypt. So now when they get, when you get hurt and you upset about stuff, now you ready to go get you a bottle. Girl, I need a drink. Oh, I need a blunt. What a blunt at. These people just blew me at work. These people just blew me at school. Oh, I can't take it anymore. I need a drink. Where's the wine? Pour up. So instead of you seeking God, you sitting up here complaining like these Israelites, if we only had died in Egypt. God didn't show these people. God gave them manna from the sky. They were eating food that was being dropped from the heavens. 40 years, 40 years. They sitting up here saying, if only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. They want to go back. They would rather go into the wilderness. That's just like a lot of people, you would rather stay in your situation of poverty rather than give your tithes and offering. Because when it's time to get to the church, you like, uh-uh, girl, see, I don't got all that money to give to the church. Can you give me $20 to tithe with? So now your tag is worse than Cain's offer. Abel gave an offering that God respected. Cain gave an offering that God did not respect. Cain got mad about it because God didn't like the offering that he brought. So now instead of you giving from the abundance of your heart, you want to go ask other people for money to give to your tag and offer. When you work a job, so you can't make a sacrifice and give what belongs to God, but you're wondering why you're struggling to pay your bills. It's because you're tipping God off. You're giving God tips instead of giving your full time and offering. Girl, you better stop. Boy, you better stop. So you have to understand, we can't tip God. So you understand, they're sitting up here saying, if only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness, they want to go back to the problem. They don't want to be set free from poverty. So when you tell them, look, just give to the house of the Lord, keep giving to God, give your tithes and offering, and you're going to be blessed. God said the testament is going to happen. Just listen to God. Instead of them listening to that, they want to stay in poverty and don't even try it at all. You don't, she don't know what she's talking about. How she know? Show me where you was tired. And now I don't got to show you nothing. I know what the Bible said. And so this is, this is the point. This is the point that don't go back into the wilderness. They want to go back into the wilderness. That's how scared they is of the giants. And when God is saying, look, I got you a promised land. They want to go back to the wilderness. They wanted to go back to Egypt and that. They, they all don't want it. 
So instead of you moving on from that abusive relationship with that boy cracking you upside the top of your head, you want to stay in that relationship because that's all you know. When God is saying, look, I, I have a husband that's trying to find you. But you being so formed with this man that's abusing you, he's courting you. He's courting you. And instead of you allowing yourself to grow and to be healed from that situation, you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into his realm of evil. When God says that the man should treat his wife as he treats his own body, he not going in the corner beating his own body up. So why you think it's okay for him to beat you upside the top of your head? So you want to stay in the wilderness. Uh-uh-uh. God is telling you to come get your promise. Get to the promised land. Quit focusing. Oh, oh I should have. If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? They go doubt and unbelief again. And guess how this started? From one bad report. They stay here listening to all this doubt and unbelief. Now they thinking God setting them up. How is God setting you up to die by the sword? Oh, see, see, God ain't gonna pick me up. See, I gotta pay my bills. I can't stand right now. I can't, I just can't. I don't have it to give. I don't have it. I don't have it. See, I can't really leave this relationship. See, because he paying half of the bills. I can't leave this relationship. It's too much going on. I cannot leave him right now. Because see, this is going on. He got to help me do this. And see, we got to handle this business next month. And then by the time next month comes, he going to hit you upside the top of your head again. Or he going to go out there and cheat on you and mess with your self-esteem level. So now you just wish all the women in the world would disappear just so he won't look at nobody else's body. God is not going to get rid of all the women in the world because you have an unfaithful hood. God wants us to depend on him. God wants you to accept him. God wants you to understand that he's not trying to set you up so that you can fall. He don't want you unhappy. God wants you to live and have abundance in your life. But these people were sitting up here saying they wanted to die. They God should have let them die in the wilderness. You know, God is about to let them fall. Well, God, we, well, God is God listening to me. God, why, you know, why are you letting this happen to me, God? Everything is not God's fault. See, I used to think that until God told me, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? You didn't include me in that decision. You just went and got married. You didn't, you didn't, you know you weren't supposed to get married. Not to that person. How you going to get mad when, when you didn't include God in your decision? You just made the choice. Instead of you moving to another state, knowing exactly what church you're going to, you didn't move to another state, didn't even care what church you was going to go to. You moved to a neighborhood, you didn't care about the commute getting to church. Better yet, you don't even feel like you got to go to church. But the word of God says, don't forget our meetings together. We are supposed to congregate at the church, the assembly, the synagogue. The synagogue is an assembly, a church, a body of, where the body of Christ meets. 
You just might need a hug one Sunday. You may never know. God might bless you. But instead of you getting blessed and, and going to the house of the Lord, you, oh, well, see, I don't got time for that. So you go to church once a month for two hours. That's 24 hours a year. You go to church once a month for two hours a month. That's 24 hours a year. And you think your life's supposed to be that much different? You expecting something different to happen when you haven't made no changes in your life? How can you expect anything different in your life if you haven't made one single step towards change? How are you going to improve yourself? So here you go, verse three, it says, our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Now they want to go back. So at the first sign of failure, now you want to go back. Let me explain to this. Doing my research on CRISPR technology of genetic engineering, the connections related to several beliefs and civil liberties. This research, I had to do this over and over again. My computer ended up getting contaminated with some virus. I downloaded software from my school. And when I did, I had 13, almost 1,300 people, participants in my computer and my school system erased it all. I had to redo the information. I didn't just have to do it once, but I did it three times. And so what I'm trying to say is failure is not an option. Failure is my opportunity. Failure is my opportunity for me to improve my life. Failure is my opportunity for me to do better in my life. Failure is my opportunity for me to invest in myself. Failure is my opportunity for me to advance into the kingdom of God. Failure is my opportunity for me to rely on God. Failure gives me the opportunity for me to trust God more. So in verse four, it says, and they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. <laughs> this, this last part right here is just something major, okay? They want to choose somebody who is brought down at their level of thinking that is not going to give them transformation, that is not going to provide them with help. They want to choose a leader to go back to the problem. They want to choose a leader that agree with their shenanigans. They want to choose a leader that they could gossip with, that they can sit there and talk about other people with, and they can have a defeated attitude with, and they can have doubt and unbelief that they spread amongst themselves. They want a leader that can enable their depression, that enable their stress level. Ultimately, negatively impacting their decisions. Because if they stress and anxiety and depression, it's messing with their brain. 
stress impacts the brain. So they said, they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They want to go back to where God uprooted them out of. They so far from getting to the promised land with this type of attitude. How you going to ever get what God promised you when you don't want to listen to God? How are you hearing the voice of the Lord? How? What is God saying to you? Have you included God in this decision that you make? And God told you that it was okay. God confirmed it to you. See, God don't just say something. He will, but he will also confirm his word to you. So how did God confirm his word to you? You don't have to tell nobody. All you need to do is know internally if God is speaking to you. So God wants us to choose him, all right? So the, the fall of Israel, the Israelites, was they doubt and unbelief, right? So let's finish reading this in verse five. I did kind of want to switch. I wanted to switch over and talk about some of the, um, wanted to talk about, uh, I wanted to talk about the tissue, but I could put this back up on Thursday and let me go over here and switch back to, um, I want to switch to the discussion in the, with the tissue, okay? And then on, on Thursday, hopefully I will be able to have some different um, soaps on here that women can purchase and also the different sanitary napkins as well, okay? So, but before I, I switch gears and, um, for a moment, I just want everyone to understand that your mental health is, is very much influenced by your perspective. So if you see yourself as defeated, if you see yourself as a grasshopper, if you see yourself going back to the problem, if you see yourself going back in the situation, it, you, you know, you have to pull yourself out, allow God to pull you out. See, you pull yourself out when you make the decision to choose God and then God does the rest. But it has to be your choice because God does not make you robotic. You have to choose God. You sitting in here and it's 24 hours in a day, but you're only spending five minutes talking to God at night. And you're wondering why you have so many problems. You can talk to God in the shower. You can talk to God in the car. You can talk to God in the bathroom, on the toilet. You can talk to God walking down the street. You can talk to God when you're putting on your clothes. You can talk to God when you're going in a nail shop while you're in a nail shop. You can talk to God while you're training. You can talk to God while you're working out. There are so many things that you can do to include God in your life. Prayer is a conversation with the Lord. That's what your uh, conversation with God is like. It's a conversation. It should be better then a conversation you have with your coworkers, it should be better than all the complaining that you do when you come home and talk about your job. It should be better than all the complaining your cousin do. do. Quit talking to people more than you talk to God. Because that's what I used to do. I would talk to people more than I would talk to God. I would go into counseling. I would, you know, be like, well, what do you think about this? And, and, and nobody seems to have an answer. But when I took it to God, God began to answer my prayers and God began to just really help me get through all of the things that I needed to get through. 
But it was a process that I had to endure, that I had to overcome within myself with the internal inconsistencies that were in myself. Because see, we all come with a set of norms and habits through our intergenerational transmissions of the things that we learn that creates our preconceived notions and belief systems. So understand that your perspective can shape your outcome. So I wanted to look at some of these tissues here. Once again, I'm going to start over because um, that's what the Lord wanted me to do. So that's what I'm going to do now. Look at some tissues. So I wanted to go to, uh, let's go to Tushy. We're going to go to Tushy. And these are all non-toxic um tissues to purchase so this looks like a nice pretty um nice website they have been rated number one with the um fidget attachment they are cnn underscore they are on vice the new yorker goop bustle the new york times and wired so they went eight years perfecting the fidget. so they they wanted wanted people to be able to wash their bums with warm water and also a heated seat. So let's look at the um, Tushy Classic. So let's see. So it looks like it come attached, you attach it to your seat and then it squirts water. So let's look at the video here. I don't hear the sound. It just shows. Oh, okay. So you can get one budget for $129. You can get two for $259. And, or you can get one budget plus the stool for $198. So let me explain this for a second. There are a lot of people in different countries that actually believe that you're supposed to wash your bum. You should wash yourself after each restroom use. Using paper, they actually view America as kind of being somewhat unclean um, because Americans use paper to wipe, to clean themselves. When, um, in fact, in many cultures, they don't believe in using paper to clean yourself. Um, you should clean yourself by washing yourself or, you know, rinsing yourself, right? And so some people like purchasing digits, right? And so you either wash your bum. Um, thank you for the love. I, I, pre I appreciate that. So you either wash your bum, you can wash your bum with warm water, or you can wash your bum with a heated seat and it has a remote control as well. So they also have um, the Tushy Ottoman. Oh, I like that. <laughs> this is so interesting because actually, when we are on the toilet and you are um, doing the number two, right? Your feet is supposed to be elevated. And what it does, it, it actually allows the proper flow of your digestive excess waste that your liver is pushing out of you. It allows it to flow more efficiently when it's coming out of your stool. Like the stool is coming out efficiently when your legs are elevated. So that is, this actually true. This is true. So the good thing about it, is that they have an ottoman for that. And I've never actually seen this before. And I find it quite fascinating a little bit to be able to look at one. But um, usually I just use a stool at home. Um, but I know that you're supposed to have your feet elevated. It, that's just the proper way to use a restroom. So like the way he's sitting, 
this is the way you're supposed to actually poop. All right. And so this is this is nice. Let's look, let's look at the one that says relax for easier crotching. Oh. I mean, it looks the same to me, but maybe it's a little different. <laughs> oh, okay. So one is nine inches, the other one is seven and a half inches. So the relaxed one is a little bit lower than the uh, original. So that's fine. Um, but that's that's interesting. That's really nice to, to purchase that. You can get the uh, Tushy Ottoman for $69. Let's look at the Tushy Toilet Brush. Oh, okay. Let's look at the video. Oh, okay. So they're like disposable. See, I don't know if I want I like, I don't like too many disposable things because uh, sometimes you just have to keep on purchasing it over and over again. But yeah, but <clears throat> um, so it has a scrubbing pack. So that's nice. They basically, it says it's eight lemon and tea tree oil infused coconut husk scrubbing pack. So you get eight of them. And um, you can also get a subscription to that. If you want to get the Tushy Toilet Brush, that is $49. And I mean, if you really like um, disposable items, just because I don't like the disposable doesn't mean that they're not healthy. So disposables are pretty good. They do have some benefits because you're not holding that bacteria in one place where bacteria can collect or uh, gain a collection of other bacteria in one specific location. So since I usually clean my entire house with bleach, it doesn't bother me to have one that doesn't have disposable. So I don't prefer to have disposables, but you may be someone that do. Um, my, my house is pretty much clean, bleached down every single week with bleach. I mean, like real, real bleach strong. Okay, so I'm not concerned about the collection of bacteria being in my bathroom. But what I do want to make um, clear is that disposables do have some benefits. So they do um, sort of prevent the collection of bacteria in one space. And so you can get that for $49. So let's look at the bamboo tissue. So you can get the premium bamboo toilet paper. And this is 36 rows, right? Um, and I just want to make it clear that none of these places have hired me to represent them at all. I am just basically trying to give you all the best type of investment that you can purchase, okay? Um, so I want to uh, first say that now in my household, we usually have 20 rows of Scott. And with those 20 rows, it lasts for about a month and a half, two months. And the reason why is because I had two females in the house, which is myself and my daughter, which she is an adult. So she does have, you know, like administration. Um, and so with the, the males, which one male adult and one uh, teenager, it's not too much that they're using tissue, you know. Um, but a proper stool, a normal stool is you should be pooping at least three to five times per day. That is normal. Okay. But let me uh put it, let me place this on hold really quick. One, give me one second. One moment. Okay, so what I wanted to show was I have toilet paper here. Now, if I open this up, see, this is one sheet. This is one sheet. So a lot of people are purchasing toilet paper and yes, they are not looking at the amount of sheets. So like I said yesterday with the Sky All Comfort, um, yes, it may have more absorbency, 
but you're not going to be using one sheet, right? <laughs> so most people, when they use the restroom, they're going to take about between four and six sheets. So this would be one, that's two, three, four, five, six, four to seven, I mean. So this is this is, should be the normal amount here, right? And so I wanted to show that because you want to look at the actual sheets that the toilet paper has. So let's look here. I'm not sure if they're going to show it. But how much water is used to produce the paper? So let's look at some of these benefits. Why bamboo? Bamboo products are not only soft like a baby panda's bottom and absorbent for optimum uh, butt patty, but it is also a sustainable resource. Bamboo absorbs 35% more CO2 per hectare than equivalent plants and can grow up to 39 inches in just one day. That means that bamboo is ultra replenishable in addition to help reducing deforestation by 15% due to toilet paper production. So it says one roll of this conventional toilet bamboo, uh, pre well, this premium bamboo toilet paper is about 37 gallons of water. That's the map. So is the bamboo made with rayon? Ray who? There's no rayon in their toilet paper. The raw material is 100% bamboo. So I like that as 100% because usually I'm looking at the ingredients and that's what I would like to go over too. I wanted to go back over the um, herbal medicine versus the traditional medicine and I wanted to go over some of the labels because I didn't do that when I went over that article that that when I created that blog I didn't um, go over the labels and so it's, it's very important for us to be looking at those labels. So on one roll of the bamboo toilet paper, it only takes about 0.5 um, gallons of water, about 0.59 gallons of water to make. So um, what kind of process is used for turning bamboo into toilet paper? Do you use chlorine? We practice biological pulping, meaning we don't use chlorine at all during the process. No bleach, all natural. So is bamboo toilet paper environmental friendly? Yes, not only are trees spared from being used to wipe our cracks, but bamboo toilet paper manufacturing releases 30% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than its hardwood counterpart. So they don't use um, trees. Will it do the job? In addition to its environmental benefits, bamboo toilet paper is also a strong but soft material, making it a lux luxurious choice that is still durable enough to do its job. Naturally hyperallergenic, antifungal, and antibacteria, bamboo toilet paper is an exceptional choice for a sensitive skin. Is bamboo toilet paper more sustainable? You know it. Bamboo is the fastest growing plant on earth. The bamboo we use grows up to 39 inches in a single day, making it a much more sustainable resource than virgin wood. So is bamboo toilet paper okay for septic tanks? Sure it is. Bamboo, bamboo is 100% biodegradable. Septic professionals are also keen on bamboo toilet paper because it breaks down faster than both virgin hardwood and recycled toilet paper. Bamboo toilet paper flushed into your septic's primary treatment system will take up less space and put a lighter strain on the bacteria working to break down the solids. Bamboo toilet paper is also free of any harsh chemicals, bleaching, or de-inking. The de-inking process that may interfere with the septic system bacteria environment. Twice the size, twice the softness, same affordable price. So I would like to look at some of the product details. So toilet paper details. Fact sheets, three ply for your number one or number two. Each roll has 300 sheets, okay? Good here. 300 sheets is not that bad. So if we calculate 300 sheets to 36 rows, we're gonna say, um, 
300 times 36. That's 10,800 sheets. That's that's pretty good. So each row um, has BPA free, no dye or bleach, flushable in the in the septic tank, um, soft, delivered straight to your door. Okay. All right. So let's let let me go ahead and put that there. So this is um, also we're gonna look at. 36 rows times 300 sheets. No, that should be 300 sheets times 36 rows. That equals 10,000, 10,800 sheets per pack. Per pack and this cost. So with the subscription is $59. Or it's $69 without subscription. So we're gonna multiply that times that by 36, and that should come to the price per row. So we have 59 times, no, 59 divided by 36. That's going to come to a dollar and 64 cents per row. We do $69 divided by 36. That's going to be, um, a dollar and 92 cents per row. So now I would say that the opportunity cost is good, right? It, it doesn't seem that bad. Okay. So you gotta look at the opportunity cost. How long will this tissue last you in a four person household, right? You're getting 36 rows. That is 10,800 um, sheets per pack. That is actually out of, you know, it, like if you get 20 rows of Scott, that's 20,000 sheets. Um, so if you get a pack of, a pack of 12 of Scott, that's 12,000 sheets. So 12,000 minus 10,800 sheets. That's 1,200 less. Um, 1,200 uh, 1200 sheets less than leading, than leading row, Scott. Scott tissue, right? All right. So we see that there, and um, hopefully I'll be able to also make this comparison to the other rows. So let me go ahead and pray. Let me stop the screen share. Um, thank you all so much for joining me today on Lost Life and Health. Um, let's talk about it. I really appreciate you all for joining me. Let me go ahead and pray. Father God, thank you so much for just leading me in this discussion. I just pray that you continue to allow us to fulfill your plan, will, and purpose. Let us see the things that you have for us, God. Reveal the people that, you know, you don't want in our lives, Father God, so that we could, you know, change our settings, change our environment so that we can surround ourselves with people that are driven and motivated by you, Lord God. We want to be able to encourage those that, you know, don't have you in their life, God. But we don't want them to be in our life every single day influencing us, God. You said in your word, that evil company corrupts good behavior. And so we want to surround ourselves with people that are God-fearing, that they driven by you, inspired by you, encouraged by you, Lord. We want to live a life of abundance, God. So allow us to be in the presence of people who are God-fearing, that believe in you, that are fulfilling your purpose, so that we can minister to the people 
who are out here doing things that are dissatisfying to you and displeasing to you, Lord. We want to live a life that is fulfilling and fulfill your plan with a purpose. So God, please orchestrate what needs to be orchestrated in our lives so that you can put pivot us and position us exactly where we need to be and fulfilling your plan with a purpose. God, we want to do the things that are satisfying to you, obedient to you, Lord. God, and it starts with the things that we allow ourselves to listen to the things that we allow ourselves to engage in, God. So we want to make sure that our perspective is aligned with your perspective, God. We want to see things from your perspective, God. We don't want to see things from our own perspective. We don't want to lean on our own understanding, Lord. We want to lean on you, God, because your perspective will lead us in the path of righteousness. Your perspective will give us prosperity. Your perspective will give us abundance. Your perspective gives us a peace of mind and not stress or depression. God, we need you, Lord. So just please allow us to just be obedient. Let us let us be filled up with your Holy Spirit. And God, keep your word hidden in our hearts. So I cover us with the blood today from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. I plead the blood of Jesus over us right now, over our hearts. God, I pray that you uproot everything in us that you did not plant. Every seed that is in our heart that you won't remove, remove it out of us right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And seal it with your blood, God. Plant your word. Let your word be planted and watered in our life and you can grow it in our life, God, so that we can grow into the children that you want us to be, the mature children that you want us to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, God, please allow your will to be done, not ours or anyone else's, but yours. In the name of Jesus Christ, it is sealed in your atonement blood. Amen. Thank you all once again for joining me. Um, if you wanted to get prayer or anything like that, please send me an email at lawslifehealth at sudden changes corporation.org or you can um, just send me some information about your um, me uh, wanting to be a writer or if you wanted to become an intern okay so I will see you all on Thursday go ahead and be blessed and please remember to be great to everybody that you are around encourage those people that you encounter because guess what you are probably the only encouragement that they will hear all right thank you be blessed. Have a good night.